So Google Summer of Code has been around for a full decade at this point, is that right? Isn't that incredible? Yeah, it is amazing. <laughs> what, what's surprised you about its evolution to this point? To be honest, what really surprises me is how little the program has changed since it started. Um, when Chris Bona put the program together in 2005 with this idea of enlisting the open source community to provide mentorship for students, um, it really was, I don't know if it was a brilliant idea and a brilliant <laughs> implementation or just it just worked. It astonishes me every year that thousands of people from around the world volunteer all this time to help kids, they probably, kids, people, that they'll probably never meet face to face develop their coding skills. It's really pretty incredible. So related to that first question, it's kind of the flip side to it, how has the program adapted during that time? We, um, we have had some changes in the breadth of orgs that apply. There's so much more open source in general out there in the wild that where in the beginning it was mostly programming tools, um, things like Apache and BSD, um, but now we get applications from like um, cities and municipalities, both in the U.S. and elsewhere, who want to develop open source uh, tools so their citizen can access open government data. Uh, never saw that coming, but it, every year there's more and more applying. Ditto open hardware. It's been a slow but steady increase in those projects coming along. What do you see happening with the open hardware stuff? That's an area I'm particularly interested in. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, in the beginning, there really wasn't hardware, yeah. and we have to be very careful about open hardware projects that we accept because we can't expect students to spend a lot of money buying board sets, for example. But um, so long as an open hardware project makes the focus of their Summer of Code participation on the software, uh, we are able to accept some organizations who self-identify as hardware products, but like everything else, open hardware needs software these days. So. Right, interesting. So reading through the history of the program, I was struck by the fact that a lot of participants come from a variety of backgrounds. It's not just computer science. Why do you think the program has attracted such a varied group of people? Well, I think that's because of the increasing ubiquity of computing in life in general. Um, something I am particularly interested in is digital humanities and the spread of um, software skills as a requirement in other scientific disciplines. You're probably familiar with Software Carpentry, a project from the Mozilla Foundation, to get scientists aware of the fact that they can build easily their own tools for their scientific disciplines and not be reliant on commercial you know, mystery box applications for their bench work. So often with successful efforts like these, there are certain things that kind of bring it together, whether it's processes or people, that kind of thing. What do you feel are the linchpins that have made this work? The mentors. The mentors are amazing. Cannot. It's really restored my faith in humanity. <laughs> I'm much less, I'm kind of a recovering cynic thanks to this program. <laughs> it's the orgs, there's so many people out there around the world who are so passionate, some driven by, um, I hesitate to use the word commercial because that's supposed to be a dirty word, but, um, and some pure altruism. There's always so much interest around humanitarian FOSS projects when we run the program. But um, the generosity and the enthusiasm of the thousands of mentors every year just really is astonishing, and the program could not run without them. So that's the special sauce. Absolutely. Interesting. Why do you think it resonates so much with them? Is it just the opportunity to give back, that kind of thing? I think people, I mean, don't we all love having something that we're good at? Sure. Of course. And yes. this gives people the opportunity to share their particular passion with people and and teach and I'm sure giving back is a lot of it for people but it's also helping other people come to love what you love feels really good. Interesting. Expanding the scope of this a little bit, how do you see open source changing in the near term? Let's say over the next year to two years. It's fascinating. I mean I've been working in open source since the mid-1980s, so well before the term was codified. 
and it used to be this let's just say there wasn't a lot of general interest in open source software you wouldn't see it on the cover of time and now I mean, open source software is in everything your refrigerator your car your toaster um, it's so much more ubiquitous and there is always the concern that that will lead to a lessening of the personal passion that drives many open source projects but I'm hopeful that it won't that um, open hardware, open robotics, um, and the expansion of the concept of open source to open data and citizen science and collaborative artwork. It's a wonderful paradigm shift, and it's really all thanks to the internet when we get right down to it. As with the printing press, broadening the access to information dramatically, now we have the internet that does that on a global scale pretty exciting times. So conceptually, open source is expanding into these other domains? Is that that's yeah. what you're tracking? That's the, the concept and the utility yeah. also. I was There's a scientist working on climate change in sub-Saharan Africa who was telling me how he, doing this research, I mean, the Sahara Desert is immense, and he's out there driving literally for weeks just to get to his research site, runs across these goat herders in the sand, they all have cell phones. People will literally go without food to pay their cell phone bill so that they can be connected to individuals and to markets. And as we know, I mean, underlying pretty much all technology these days is open source. So it's pretty incredible to see the yeah. spread. Interesting. Last question for you. What people or projects are you keeping an eye on these days? There's a conference whose name I'm going to, of course, blank on because I'm on camera. <laughs> That's a digital humanities concept. I've been talking a little bit with the people at the University of California, Santa Cruz, about how um, traditional humanities majors, I was an American studies major, um, can use technology in their research and in support of their mission, largely around the areas of spreading, spreading narrative so as to engage people with the social sciences I also think Software Carpentry is a fantastic program. Um, I'm keeping an eye, there's a um, public library for cell research results, or not results, lab results, that a friend of mine is a principal investigator on. And uh, so I've been, that's all done in open source and Creative Commons license, so I'm curious to watch that. And then there's the myriad of programs getting uh, underrepresented people engaged in open source. and. It's hard to keep up. Quite it's, a lot. It's Quite a lot to keep track thing. of. Yeah. It's a good, good thing. And then if I ever need less sleep, I'd also be really curious to develop a list of all the government agencies around the world that are um, investigating and in many cases encouraging their governments and their populations to engage in open source. That'd be quite a list. I hope so. Yeah. I, so I, I can think of... The UK, Norway, Oman, Germany, and there's a lot out there, and I was um, asked, you know, do you keep a list? It's like, no, <laughs> shucks. That's a good <laughs> idea. Maybe to do. Right, right. <laughs> so if anybody wants to do that for me, that would be awesome. Great, great, excellent. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate you taking the time. Thank you.